Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm Jeff McCreese. I'm the Deputy Director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, and it's an honor to have uh, you all here for another installment in our Brain Series and Leadership Speaker Series. Uh, today, we have the, uh, the honor of, uh, of wel welcoming uh, Dr. Jess Moeller from the Naval Academy's Midshipman uh, Development Center. Uh, a few biographical notes on Dr. Moeller. She's a clinical and uh, sports psychologist. Uh, she's worked here at the Naval Academy for seven years as the uh, coordinator of sports psychology services within the uh, Midshipman Development Center. Of note, she's a, a member of the United States Olympic Committee Sports Psychology Registry. Uh, Dr. Moeller has a master's uh, degree from the University of Maryland at College Park and a uh, PhD from Loyola University in, uh, in Maryland. Uh, she was commissioned after that as a Navy Lieutenant and did uh, time at the uh, medical facilities at uh, NAS Jacksonville, at uh, Guantanamo Bay and at Bethesda. And she's a uh, frequently invited speaker uh, internationally on the application of sports science in the military, gender differences and youth uh, development. Uh, as a reminder, please keep your microphone on uh, mute during the course of our conversation. Uh, Dr. Moeller will present uh, some material and then uh, we'll have some time for discussion and question and answer after that. Uh, these uh, brain science and effective leadership uh, speaker series are made possible uh, through a generous grant from the Robert and uh, Mary Looker Foundation. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Moeller. And we turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation. It doesn't look like it's too big of a group, so I may kind of ask for some feedback at times if, um, if, if you're willing to kind of give some of your thoughts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw my put my slides up here now and um, give us a little bit of a, a frame of reference as I speak. Um, so hopefully now you can see what I'm seeing. Um, wonderful. So um, I have really combined kind of the fields of, of athletic and military performance for a, a number of years, kind of seen it through in many ways, a very similar lens. Um, you know, there was, a, there was an article in, in 2008 in a journal of military psychology, and, and that author, um, Godwin, said essentially these, these two disciplines really have kind of common and collaborative interests that seems intuitive um, given the commonalities and you know what we ask athletes and military members to do and also in the environmental stressors um, that they that they experience um, there's just a number of shared characteristics between kind of athletic and military environments um, and really the way in which the brain operates in these environments also has a lot of similarities um, in particular, this journal that I'm, I'm citing, um, they actually also, uh, it was an invited, um, kind of invited edited uh, journal, and uh, there are two researchers that were invited to, to contribute, um, Dr. Hatfield and uh, Dr. Chris Janelle. Uh, Dr. Hatfield was from the University of Maryland, so, and, and one of my advisors um, when I was in my master's program. And a lot of the information I'm going to talk today actually is based in that kind of original um, article that he, he had started this work long before uh, 2008. Um, I wanted to kind of just give some idea of like what I'm talking about, right? I didn't know exactly the population that was going to be um, joining me today. So what are we talking about when I'm, when I kind of mentioned this idea of um, performance, right, combined with um, the kind of um, psychological factors involved in these moments. Um, so I'm going to just put some pictures up here, right, of athletes, right, uh, kind of just in the moment of performance, you begin to see some psychological factors, I think, um, in some of these faces as we look at them, right? I love this one, right? Uh, everybody's lined up, head facing down, hands on the track, and one person's doing something different, um, right? Emotionally, kind of where are they compared to everybody else on that track? Um, and how does that situation, right? How does that moment really influence uh, that performer? Um, again, another kind of sporting situation. I don't know if anybody follows uh, tennis. Andy Murray is known as kind of a bit of a, uh, a bit of a hothead. Uh, actually, if you followed him um, in between, if you made a mistake, you'd and and watched his lips move after his mistakes. Uh, they would have to be censored because often there was bad language coming out of his mouth. 
Um, interestingly enough, he'd often come back and win the next point. So he was also somebody who really didn't want to make mad because uh, it really actually helped his performance. So this idea that there's this connection between right, thoughts, feelings, um, and, and performance. So let's move it to the military side of the house, right? Um, you know, and, and again, how do these situations influence the psychological factors that are involved in performance? And also, how does the performer learn how to adapt, right? Because we, we have to adapt, otherwise we don't get the performance that we want. Um, you know, thoughts and emotion, at the end of the day, are, are driven by brain processes, right? They, they happen in between our ears. Um, and these processes are really critical to performance. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know that my bio was read and I, I certainly appreciate that. You know, University of Maryland was my first um, grad school opportunity. I came out of undergrad. Uh, I was a sailor in college. There's somebody on this call right now who's in front of me, I think a little bit for being a sailor, but that was my sport. At Naval Academy actually was my a bit of my enemy at the time, um, and you know so that was that was what I did, um, and I had an experience where our team worked with a sports psychologist. My my roommate was on um, the national team and had had that opportunity, uh, so that was kind of my intro into this world of, of performance psychology. When I entered the University of Maryland as a grad student, I just had this idea of I wanted to help athletes perform. I wanted to understand um, athlete performance. Um, under varying conditions and, and learn how to help them consistently perform. What I had no idea about at the time um, was the neuroscience that I would really come to learn um, is it's at the heart of, of what I do right? and, and the way in which um, performers get to, to the elite status. Um, and, and in so many ways, even though it's the heart of what I do, I don't often talk about it with the performers, right? They, they don't know, right, that this is my goal, right, is to, is to um, have the brain change, right, develop in some way uh, so they get the performance they want. Um, in 2001, my advisor, uh, Dr. Brad Hatfield, Professor Brad Hatfield, um, wrote a chapter in a book. It's called The Psychophysiology of Sports, right, a Mechanistic Understanding of the Psychology of Superior Performance. And that was... Um, so pretty early on in um, understanding how the brain, that the psychophysiology of the brain influence performance and how we can actually measure it. Um, this presentation in many ways is based a lot on um, that work, um, that work that I was, you know, had the opportunity to learn when I was a grad student at Maryland. Um, he in particular, um, he talked a lot about efficiency and you're gonna hear me mention that today. Um, you know, the efficiency of the brain um, under, you know, different situations, different environmental factors, and how that had some, you know, significant impact on performance. Again, I kind of say, I, you know, I don't, I don't talk about this a lot with the performers I work with. Occasionally, it will come up because I'm trying to teach something and, um, you know, get them to understand why we're working in this way. Um, but really, uh, today, I hope to share some of the conceptual model um, that, I, that I work on, right, with, the, with these performers. Um, and give you an understanding about that. Um, so here we go. I'm going to start with a little bit of a, um, some, some words here, a lot of words actually on, on the next couple slides. Um, so peak performance. What am I really talking about? All right. So um, Williams and Crane in 1998 um, put this out around peak performance. They had looked at the idea of kind of what does peak performance look like? What are the factors and the psychological aspect that are associated with it? Um, as you read through this, um, you know, I, I think there are a number of things you probably recognize, maybe even recognizing yourself when you've been um, at kind of your uh, top level performance in whatever you do, right? Whether that's as a professor, um, I'm going to use actually here uh, shortly the PRT as an example because I know a lot of you have to actually do a PRT um, or PFT, right, or some type of physical test. Um, but we consider, right, this is this idea of peak performance. Um, this isn't measurable. As you, as you read these words, right, that's not necessarily measurable, right, through any type of, um, you know, brain science. Um, but what Dr. Hatfield um, and Dr. Landers started to begin to realize is that maybe there's this way to actually look at this in the brain and understand this in a different way. Um, again, this might look a little small. I'm not exactly sure how big this is on your screen, um, but this is Fitz and Posner. This is, you know, in the late 60s, 
right? Um, this idea that attainment of the ideal performance state increases the probability that the high level athlete will perform effectively and in a state of automaticity without interference, right? And I think that's really important to think that, that high level athletes can, can perform without the interference of irrelevant cognitive and effective processes. So without thoughts and feelings that are important uh, to, to uh, you know, accomplishing that, that task. Um, and that's really in some ways the kind of um, framework that uh, as I begin now to talk about some of the neurocognitive processes involved in this, um, that, that's what we're working towards. Um, let me go to my next slide here. Um, so this is, I think, just another way to say this, right? Um, so what we're talking about is efficient, and you'll hear, hear this word a lot, I think, as I speak today. Um, it's about efficient allocation of psychological resources. Um, and I should say it's really athletes and military performers, so I left them out of that. Um, that we're only paying attention to task-relevant processes, only the things that matter in the moment. Right? And for those of you who have been in some type of performance domain, you probably understand a little bit about what this is like, right? So I'm going to use uh, tennis. Uh, I already used a tennis player in one of the books I'm going to reference today. Also talks a little bit about tennis. So, right, if I think about tennis, right, in particular, what are the things that a tennis player in the moment of high level performance needs to pay attention to? And we find, right, that tennis players can get distracted by other things in those moments that takes them away from an efficient performance. That ball's coming, uh, I don't know, 90 miles an hour at you, maybe even faster at times. It's a fast moving ball. If you are distracted by something else going on in the brain or in your environment that the brain is now attending to, that ball has flown by you and you've just lost a point, right? If we think about this in military terms, Right? I think there are a lot of different overlaps there that we can consider, right? So efficiency is really the key, right, to a lot of these high-level performances. And, you know, our brain is it's highly specialized. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in, in, as well. So it's, it's really specialized. Um, and we want to be able to match, right, the best neural resources with the situational demand at hand. Like that's how we want to match, um, and that doesn't always happen automatically. Um, you know, I think so. If you talk to an exercise physiologist, somebody who's an expert in fitness, um, they get this from a muscle perspective really easily, right? Um, the more efficient our motor control system is working, right, the less stress on this system, right, uh, and ultimately the lower amount of energy we expend, right. So we train to this. Right? We, we, if we want to run faster, right, we start running. And what happens, our muscles not only get bigger, faster, stronger, but they become more efficient. Only the muscles that need to be activated are activated for that foot to go one in front of the other. Right? And that efficiency helps us run farther, longer, faster. Right? And we understand this, I think, pretty easily from a physical standpoint. Um, and what, you know, what, what this research now is suggesting, and it's been for a long time, is that the brain really works the same way. It is the brain who's actually operating those muscles, right? So efficiency, right? It's really the minimization of resources. And, and that's what we're working towards. Um, some of you may have heard of um, Erickson's theory of deliberate practice. Um, that gets a, a lot of talk um, and a number of different circles. I think it's a really valuable theory. Um, one of his um, research um, areas is with chess players. And again, some of you may have known this research, but um, I think it kind of points at, at this um, dynamic in a really nice way. So um, generally, uh, some of the research suggests that uh, grand masters in chess see less moves available on the chessboard, not more than experts. So let me say that again, right? So grandmasters in chess are the best, right? So experts are pretty good too. Right? But we actually, the data shows that if the better you are in chess, the less moves you see in the moment. That's efficiency. Because it's not just that they see the less moves, they see the less better moves available. It is much easier to make a decision if I've got three choices 
versus if I got 10 choices, right? And it leads to better outcomes and performance. Right. And so that's what we're talking about is that efficiency. It is it is it is more efficient to see less than more. But we got to see the right less um, in order for performance to be at a high level. Um, you know, I talked already about um, I'm just going to use the PRT today as the example. Um, but, you know, if we think about our runner. Um, hopefully you have all right. Many of you actually have probably taken a PRT or know what goes on for our midshipmen when they take a PRT. Um, as we train, right, those muscles, they build, uh, they become more efficient. Um, the brain's neural networks, right, also form these nice, neat paths as well, right? So we have this efficient movement, um, right? But what if the situations change, right? So we're training around Farragut, right? We run over and over around Farragut to kind of get to, to, to get our fastest PRT time. But is running around Farragut on a Wednesday afternoon, you know, at four o'clock when there are lots of people out running, the sun is shining, it's a lovely day outside. Is that the same situation, right? On a Saturday morning when maybe it's a little chillier and you've got everybody around you, right? And everybody's moving towards this PRT. Um, could, and in fact, because since I have a pretty small group here, anybody kind of identify some of those situations that kind of can influence your performance um, in that PRT? We don't want to mention any of their own just kind of observations of themselves or right other midshipmen they've heard talk about. What are those things that affect that? I imagine if there's a bunch of other nervous mids around, right, they're going to influence you getting nervous. Totally, right? So we pick up on others' energy. Absolutely. Like there's a contagion phenomenon, right? Others get nervous and I react to that, right? And now that influences my performance. I saw on there weather. I, I can't tell you how often I hear that. Like they say it's going to be cold or it's going to be windy. So um, I, I'm always curious, like does that really affect the physical ability? Does it, does it actually affect like muscle, right? Uh, like clothing, absolutely. Does it actually affect like you know, muscle ability, or is really the impact on the brain, right? Because now I'm anticipating, right? It's going to be harder. And if I think something's going to be harder, do I have to allocate more resources to get myself ready? Well, now I've just burnt extra energy and I have less energy at the time of that moment, right? And so how do we continue to think about that? Um, yeah, assignment of the grade, absolutely. The outcome, absolutely. Right. And so we these pressures, right, they they influence the situation innately. Right. A grade doesn't affect a muscle's ability to contract. Right? The brain, the way in which it interprets right, that situational dynamic and sends that net message and gets those neural networks right to, to um, you know, form what may have been a nice, neat neural pathway um, on a Wednesday afternoon run versus. Saturday morning where this matters, um, let me let me increase this a little bit. Not only do I want to get an A potentially, but what if I'm the other side of this? What if I didn't pass one already? I'm actually now facing getting kicked out for this, right? Um, think about that and the neural networks that are activated in that same time. So to think that those two students have the same exact, you know, situational factors in that moment and the same, um, you know, experience, absolutely not. Of course, we can train to that. Right. Um, some things that weren't uh, mentioned that I think is important and kind of pull on my psychologist hat. Right. Um, let's think about sleep. Right. How does sleep now affect right neural resource allocation? Right. Now I, I had an argument with my you know my, my friend, my roommate. Right. And now I'm walking out to the PRT. Where's my mind? And what are, and are those same emotional pathways? Right. Um, yeah, it affects everything. Sleep, I think, is what she was talking about. Everything affects everything. Right. But it's interesting. Right. You need to consider about right efficiency. Um, and and that and really performing to your best ability um, under a range of, of different situations. So I'm going to move a little more to my uh, kind of the the neurocognitive uh, piece of this here. Um, so um, and I, I'm going to I'm going to frame this with um, I'm an applied sports psychologist. Okay, what I do is right I help people achieve their goals. I'm working with them, like in my office, typically occasionally walking around Farragut uh, or occasionally on a practice field. Um, you know, I, but, but my goal is I'm an applied um, sports psychologist. Um, of course, I have a background 
right? I spent, you know, a, a couple of years underneath um, Dr. Hatfield's, um, you know, advisement back in the day. Um, and I really value, right, this information. I am not, I would not call myself a neuroscientist. I would be um, inaccurate by calling myself that. I'm not. Um, but I have a good understanding of it. And I, and I think about this as, as I do my work. And the idea is, right, that there's really this value in linking, right, physiology, right, cognition, right, thoughts, feelings, um, and performance. The two ways that I've experienced this in my background, one is through visual search patterns. So Chris Janelle, who's out of the University of Florida, Dr. Janelle, is, uh, does a lot of research in this area and looks at how does the eye track under varying conditions and when I'm an expert or a novice. Right? And he has found significant differences in the way our eye changes, right? So there's actually a quiet eye period, right? We actually focus differently, right, when we're an expert versus a novice. That's not going to be the focus of my presentation today, but I want you to know it exists, right? And, as, and we talk about the brain clearly, right, the visual, visual motor kind of um, and, and, um, integration is so important. Um, what I'm talking about today, right, is EEG. Um, and we have, I see um, Professor Blanco has joined the call, which I'm excited about. Um, and he has been um, a part of this research in particular that I'm going to cite here in a little bit. Um, he is definitely an expert at EEG in much more ways than I am. Um, but I do think about this, right? And I um, consider this in terms of what are the psychological factors that are really involved in performance, right? Um, so... What, what this, again, this, this research, when, what I'm going to talk about today is that um, the correct response, right, the neural networks that work best for us, right, can actually be selected and executed, right? Like emotions and thoughts can be identified through electrical energy in the brain. That's really powerful that we can actually identify thoughts and feelings. Now, we can't say like, necessarily, right, what those thoughts and feelings are, but we can say they exist, right? They're not just these things that we experience. I think a lot of times people don't kind of put power into those thoughts and feelings. They kind of dismiss them, but these are really measurable. Um, they're actually energy in the brain. And when that energy, right, is not managed effectively, performance declines, right? And we can see that in a lot of different ways. I will mention um, one um, kind of brain wave electrical energy um, that that I um, am going to mention today, and that is alpha. So we know, and some of you may have heard kind of alpha waves, theta waves, delta waves. Delta waves are sleep, right? So if, if you've heard of these, like th those are the waves I'm talking about. Um, but this idea that our brain really has this regional specialization, like there are regions of our brain that specialize in certain activities, and when just those areas are activated, right, we, we can see um, improvements in performance. I'm going to show another, I'm going to show a picture of this. I, I like this picture, um, right? It's not mine. It comes from a textbook uh, from Alan and Bacon in 2001, right? And I think it, it's nice because it just shows this picture of how movement occurs, right? So it starts kind of in the middle of the brain in the cerebrum, right, which is the large outer part of the brain, right? That's the part of the brain that really controls learning and speech and thinking and emotions and also planned muscle movement, as you can see, right, uh, out here in the cerebrum, um, you know, it, it walking. Every single time we walk, um, that, that area of the brain, right, is, is triggered. And we pull all this information that's kind of thrown at the frontal lobe here, that prefrontal cortex, and that's when we have kind of a plan for motion, and then it's shot to our motor cortex and we move, right? It's happening constantly. Um, and it's good to understand this because this is where the interruption happens, right? When the specialization is off, right? When parts of the brain are activated, that really shouldn't be activated in that moment to make that nice kind of pattern occur, right? That's where we see disruption in performance. Right? So we can really see motor movement happens in a specific pattern um, when we are affected. I'm sorry, when we are effective. You know, and, and athletes, I think, and military performers, occasionally what we'll hear is, like, I don't even know why I just did something. I just did it and it worked. There's almost like this freedom of thought that occurs in this high-level performance. Right? Does that mean the brain's not working? No. It means the thought area of the brain has quieted. 
and the areas of the brain that need to be active, right? That need to be, you know, full of energy. They are the only ones that are activated, right? Um, it, you know, it kind of feels like we're thinking about nothing, but we're not, right? It's just that the other parts of the brain, right? They're really being activated, right? During superior performance. Um, and that's what I'm really helping athletes achieve. I gotta stop saying just athletes because also military performers because I work with both um, in, in a lot of different ways. So I'm gonna start with one of um, the studies that, so I, I grabbed studies that were done at the academy. I just thought it was important. I'm speaking to academy group. I, I really wanted you to see like what's been done here. Um, and so what you see is this nice little target on this page here. Um, this was a study done, uh, you can see a, a number of years ago. Um, and it was done actually with our own uh, pistol team here and our um, rifle team. Um, and what they did was they had them uh, use their weapons to aim at essentially a computerized target. They measured brain waves. So they had a kind of cap on their head that was measuring brain waves um, all, over their, all over their brain. Um, and they measured those brain waves in kind of these little moments. Um, prior to the performer pulling that trigger. And what they found between the experts and the novices is that experts, all right, kind of had a very similar pattern of firing, um, sorry, aiming, so that you actually could see the aim on the screen. Um, there'd be this kind of similar aiming pattern, but 300 milliseconds prior to trigger pull, the brain changed, right? There was a, a difference in the lateral um, activation in the brain when the shooter hit the target, right? So we're now beginning to see the brain actually shifts. That's right prior to um, you know, a successful performance. The novices never changed, right? They stayed active all over the brain, right? And so what does that tell us, right? That experts that are trained at doing this, right? That communication in the brain changes when they are successful and when they know what they're doing, right? Essentially, right, lesser skilled shooters, right, have less um, engagement, right, between the, the sides of the brain, um, which is really important, right? There's actually, right, this change between, in particular, right, this study showed, right, left temporal association and the motor control, right? So we actually see a side of the brain get activated and with the motor control, um, the um, uh, motor cortex, right? Um, more specifically, right, we actually see, again, brain waves change, right? Um, and, and I think that's really powerful to be able to notice um, in, in these performers. Um, you really see this quieting or relaxation, right, of the left temporal side when somebody successfully fires, right? That's important. So there's a quieting of that mind. Um, and so what does that mean, right? It may mean, right, those experts, they're using less energy. They're more efficient. They're not relying on self-talk. They're not relying on kind of, you know, this, this thought process in order to have success. Um, and as well, so if we think about this, right, we would think that then the novice, right, they have much more activity going on in the brain. They're less efficient. Um, and really, that means they're, they're working hard, right? They're working harder than the expert. The interesting thing is, right, so when we can also begin to actually differentiate not only experts from novices, but experts from when they have successful trigger pulls versus non-successful trigger pulls. So we can see an expert who doesn't have that quieting and then doesn't have success. Right, so we can actually now kind of train to that aspect. And then we can also ask them, so how are you feeling and thinking, right, when you were successful? And how do we help you repeat that pattern, right? That's the applied sports psychologist in me when we begin to understand that. Um, so also, right, I talk about situational factors, right? So what does high stress do to the brain? Right? It makes it more active. Right? And low stress? Right, we, it's easier to get that kind of asymmetrical activation, one side of the brain, right, being active while um, one side is quiet. And that's how stress kind of can impact. Um, so I'm gonna go to another study here. Um, and this is where Professor Blanco kind of comes into play here. Um, so 
uh, this was some aviation research. Now, this was kind of our first stage of this. This is actually our exercise physiologist back in the day, Captain Mike Prevost, who's now retired. I think he's out, he's out of the military now, but um, he was our volunteer, one of our volunteers. I don't think I have any aviators on here. If I did, there's actually a, a chance some of you actually volunteered for this study um, a number of years ago. So um, this was looking also obviously at the brain. In particular, right, this research was looking at um, the, this is a, a dry EEG cap. So often EEG is measured with this like gel that you put on the scalp. It's very messy um, and uh, just kind of um, challenging to use. Um, and what this, the research team at this time was really looking to see um, uh, can a dry EEG, so there's, there's no um, gel in this, like you could essentially put this anywhere. Um, I think this research in particular was sponsored by um, Lockheed Martin for the F-35. So now we're talking about actually putting this type of cap like within a helmet that actually measures the pilot in real time as they're flying to understand how much energy, how much effort they're actually putting into flying. Um, so what we were looking at with this research is, um, you know, what was the brain saying during a flying task? Right. So how is it reacting? Um, and this was a, it was, I think it was kind of a, a neat study in that it, it had this um, uh, this sound that was played. So we actually did this with um, those who were uh, in um, oh, the pilot program over the summer that they take. And I'm also blanking on the name of it. And um, so uh, it was a bunch of midshipmen pilots and also officer pilots. And we played a sound. I think it was like every few seconds they played a sound as they were doing this simulated flight task. Um, and we did different um, variations in the simulated flight task, right? Hard, easy, um, and kind of a medium. And what, right, you, we kind of found what, mostly what was expected, um, and that is um, when you play that sound, right, you want the brain to respond to that sound, right? That it's a sound that's played, you want the brain to notice, right, that the sound was played. And if we begin to measure the brain in the area, right, that it should recognize that sound, that begins to kind of create a fuel gauge, right? It, it creates a gauge of how much attention do I have left, right? If I can fly this airplane, right, and hear that sound loud and clear, and the brain is really hearing that sound loud and clear, that means I have a lot of other attention available. If I am so saturated on my task, if I am so involved in flying that my brain can't respond to that sound, right? I have less fuel available, right? So when we measure the brain, when that sound is played, we get a little fuel gauge, right? Of how much attention is available. Um, I think that's really interesting to think about, right? So how much fuel is left in the tank? Um, I don't know. So this is where Professor Blanca, I don't know if you wanted to pipe in at all and kind of add anything to this. And this is, so we were both looking at the same research, essentially, same data, and he's now the um, principal investigator for all this this research. Um, but I don't actually don't know exactly where we are in doing it, but um, I was really interested in what the sound meant. I'm sorry, in what the um, signal meant. I, I think Justin, you were really involved and in, um, interested in that the signal was reading the correct way. So it's so interesting, right, that we can be looking at the same data and have different interests in it. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that real fast, since I see you on the call. Yeah. Hi. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, the part of the part of the research that I was involved with, yeah, was definitely kind of the sig the signal processing piece, and in particular, uh, what we were what, what we were looking at in the study that we did, which was a few years after the ones you're citing here, was whether we could um, get a window and be basically be able to predict uh, whether you know the difficulty of the flight task without inserting uh, some sort of test probe. So that, that was the, so the way, the way that it had, done pre, uh, had been done previously was via measuring what they call the oddball potential, right? Which requires kind of the introduction of some exogenous stimulus to try to kind of evoke um, a response. And what we were looking at in the study that, you know, uh, that I did, I think it was 2016 or 2018, was could we basically do the same thing, get a gauge as to be able to predict the difficulty of the task without inserting that kind of audible probe. And it turns out we were able to, uh, which was kind of interesting because it said that, you know, there was something going on just in the sort of background, you know, that we were able to pull out um, without having to do something that might be, uh, you know, introducing this auditory probe, you know, kind of may or may not be practical if, if what you're trying to do is have a kind of real world implementation of, of this uh, metric for measurement. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I mean, it was it was 
it was really fun for me to be able to actually now collaborate like across the academy, right? And um, and um, you know get somebody else involved in this research. This is you know their area of expertise and their professor type. Um, and it you know I think Justin, you ended up with a um, a Trident scholar who also looked at this. Um, we did, yeah. yeah, it was great. Yep. And I think that so really, I mean, there are all kinds of ways to think about right this kind of science and the way that um, we understand the brain. Um, so what I, I just want to kind of summarize, right, that as the challenge increased, right, so like the task demands, the things to pay attention to, attentional reserve was attenuated, right? It like kind of went down. Um, and, you know, and the performance then decreased, right? So you can see these relationships, right? Um, we can see, right, that superior performance has mental economy, right? Um, and, you know, I think it's really interesting to think about that. Recently, they're looking at, um, I think, some heads-up displays within helicopters, right? Because helicopters, um, you know, one of the challenges is, um, and, and when they're flying very low, they crash. Um, and so how do you develop better heads-up displays? So it's not just, you know, an engineer developing a better heads-up display that they think is going to work, right? That they think is going to, you know, to, um, create um, a better outcome. It's actually looking at the brain now with this heads up display and how does the brain respond? Um, I think that that's really powerful to think about. Um, and I encourage anybody on here, right, who's thinking about, right, who is developing a system, right, some, any type of system, right, when we're trying to make a warfighter be, you know, be more capable, uh, that we can actually measure this, right? We can measure whether the brain is responding the way in which you expect it to, or, or not, um, and, that, and that really has an impact on performance. Okay, um, so my next slide is not gonna cause much reaction, I don't think, amongst you, although if I have a couple of mids on here, they may have a little bit of a reaction. Anybody wanna mention where, what this is? Who knows? It's the PRT line. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's the PRT line, right? So for mids? What, 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 how do you think they react to this picture? If I show this picture during PRT season, what, what, do, you, what do you think goes on in their minds? Writing the PRT. Uh, yeah, right? I mean, I actually, when I do my presentations, when they're a little more in person, I had everybody in front of me, um, I would see facial expressions. I mean, they would drastically change. Right? I can't tell what they're thinking and feeling by their facial expression, expression um, changing, but I know there's extra energy going on in that brain. Um, I can tell you that to me, um, this is a blue line on asphalt and there's cars around it and it's a really pretty view. But I, I don't have much emotional reaction to this at all. Right? And some of you as well have no emotional reaction to this. But think about right now that moment, right? How does that emotion and thought process activate the brain and simply interfere with motor control. So now, right, when you begin to see this, you know, PRT performer who has begun to develop this inefficient, right, running stride because they're, they're nervous, right, like this all makes sense. And inefficiency didn't start in the body, right, it started in the mind. Um, and there are ways in which, right, we can kind of get at this. Certainly we can measure it, we can understand it. Like when I think about that happening, I know that that started at the brain level. It wasn't, it wasn't at the body and trying harder. Oh, good luck. It's like the worst thing you can do, right? Um, you know, not until a, you know, a pitcher or a batter or a tennis player, try harder, right? They're going to activate all these extra resources. You're actually going to create muscle tension in shoulders that you don't need to run very fast if you start trying harder, right? So you need to think about, right? Now, I, I suggest, right? There are ways to think about this. Um, and, and in a little bit different way, a nuanced way, if we begin to think about really what's happening at the brain level um, and how we get successful performance. Um, I'm gonna bring this back to some kind of common reads um, and a couple of my favorite books and I think how this plays itself out. Um, this is one of my favorite books, it's called The Inner Game of Tennis. Um, this is written by a man named Tim Galloway. He's a tennis coach. He, started, he was coached in the 70s. He, had, he knew nothing about brain science, zero. I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, he was a tennis coach who liked coaching, and he noticed things. He was an observer. And what he noticed back in the 70s um, was that 
oh, yeah, we read the book in College Sailing. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, so right, like what he began to notice, right, is that um, when he was coaching people, his, his athletes, they started doing worse. And of course, what would you want? You'd want them to do better. Right, so I'm going to tell you just a really brief story of, of what happened in his one of one of the stories he cites is a woman who comes in, he's coaching her, um, he begins to, um, you know, kind of tell her how to correct her swing. She's a pretty good player. She has a nice swing. He kind of continues to give her feedback, and her swing just gets worse and worse. And he's watching this like talented tennis player as he's giving her feedback get worse. And so he says, I got to, like, uh, this, is, this doesn't make any sense, right? And um, so he kind of stops his instruction and, and he asks her to do two things. I want you, when you see the ball bounce, I want you to say bounce. And when you see the ball make contact with your racket, I want you to say hit. So instead of now thinking about all the things she has to do, step forward, racket height, you know, I don't know all the things that, you know, tennis players have to change. She now is simplified to bounce hit bounce hit. She's occupying the thinking side of the brain with something that is completely controllable. And what happens, right? My guess is if we measured that brain in that moment, we would see a lot of efficiency where the doer side of the brain, the resources associated, specialized for doing would be active, right? And the thinking that do not need to be active, right, would be quiet. And just be, be simple, right? Bounce hit, bounce hit. Right. Um, and he knew this back in the 70s. And of course, this has now come, you know, the, the research shows this is this is the case. Um, I love this book. It's one of my favorites. It's actually a very simple read. If you want to like, learn a little bit about sports psychology, the current one, actually, the Ford is written by um, Pete Carroll uh, when he was at USC as a football coach. Um, there are a lot of different coaches from a lot of different sports who really recommend this book because it really gets at this idea. Of how do you be the doer or the thinker? Um, I'm hoping some of you know thinking fast and slow. Um, I think this is actually talked about a lot in um, over in Loose Hall and, and research. Um, uh, you know, he talks about two systems, right? He talks about an involuntary system and a voluntary system, system one and system two, right? As I read this, right, knowing my background and, you know, um, with, with working with Dr. Hatfield, right, I begin to think about efficiency, right? So that involuntary, that's an efficient process. That happens quick, right? Um, the voluntary system, that's where sometimes, right, it begins to interfere, right, with that involuntary process that's happening, right? Um, so, you know, some of these examples, and he actually even talks about this, you know, like what's it like to be um, a sprinter and bracing for the starting signal in a race? So you're sitting there waiting, right? Getting out of the starting blocks is a very... Um, complicated process in some ways. It takes actually a lot of learning to get there, but once you're an expert at it, it happens very quickly, and it's really critical to sprinters to, to moving fast. Well, now what happens is some of this voluntary stuff start interfering with this involuntary action. Starting signal, get out of the blocks, right? That's the involuntary thing that you want to train. Now, if I have this thought, right? Oh, is my you know left quad sore, right? Oh, am I gonna, am I gonna, am I gonna tense enough in order to get out of the blocks? That's that voluntary system thinking that then interferes and actually get you out of the block slower. There's some really interesting research in this where they actually have a sprinter, instead of just getting out of the blocks when they hear that starting signal, they actually would say, I want you to say a word when you hear that starting signal, pow, a one syllable word. And what they found is those who say that one syllable word get out of the blocks faster than those who don't say anything to themselves, right? Because it's efficient to be able to pair a word with a starting signal. It's a lot more complicated to pair an entire right motion um, body motion to get out of those starting blocks. Um, I'm going to, I have some older people in this call that are in my age bracket. So I'm hoping some of you have watched Men in Black, one of my favorites. I use this example with college kids and they have no idea what I'm talking about, right? That's the age difference. Um, so the, the moment that I'm talking about here is why I think one of the, one of the more funny scenes and, you know, influential scenes, right? They, they're all those military men, there could be some women, but some of those military people, right? They're all like taking the exams, right? Um, and their little eggs and right. Uh, Will Smith goes and grabs the coffee table. Like he just like, okay, this is more efficient if I grab a coffee table and just write my stuff out, right? And then they all move right to the shooting scene. Hysterical, right? Like, so what happens, right? All these military people, all these aliens kind of pop out and all the military people, they shoot all the aliens, 
And Will Smith, and hopefully some of you have seen this scene, right? Will Smith, actually, there's a little girl with holding books and he shoots her, right? And so, right, like everybody's like, whoa, like why did you shoot the little girl with the books and not all the aliens, right? So system one, involuntary, right? Military members trained to kill aliens, right? They look foreign. Will Smith, right? He's been in a lot of different situations. Right? He says, wait a second. Well, yeah, aliens look dangerous, but like this little girl seems the most threatening. That's that voluntary system coming in, right? And making a difference and changing, right? And then he's allowed to have very efficient movement. So my the value of this is right, you can program system one, right? We can become more efficient with training. Um, and again, that gets measured in the brain. I know I'm I'm getting a little bit short on time. I wanted to at least mention this. Uh, this is one of those like famous, right? Things that many of you have probably seen. It's called the Stroop effect. It's incredibly um, uh, frustrating if you want to do this for time. Um, but the idea is, right, this to me gets at, right, this thinking brain versus this doing brain. And when we change the colors of the word, it interferes with our doer just going, right? Which, you know, if we were just reading the words, it would be super fast. But, but the Stroop effect, right, changes the colors of the words, right? And how well do we, right, as performers, athletes or military members, how well do we inhibit, right, that cognitive interference that occurs when we're processing a specific stimuli, right? So, and what impedes that process? Can we identify it? And then can we train to it? Right? Um, I think if you consider this in like running for the PRT, right, can you imagine, you know, a uh, um, you know, you start running, right? Your legs feel great. You know, you're not thinking about anything, right? You're just kind of running and you feel good. You're on pace. And all of a sudden you notice your legs feel heavy. Well, now you got some interference, right? You have another message in your brain. And what is the natural response to your legs feeling heavy? Slow down, right? But that's, that's, the, that's like the involuntary response. When something hurts, you pull back from it. That's what we're trained to do. And yet in that moment, right, I've, I've, I've got to win. Right? I've got to keep my pace. I can't slow down. Well, so now I've got this, this inhibiting right, information in my brain that I have to manage, right? Because I want my legs to continue to move fast and I've got to control that. And, and the more efficient I can get at that, the better I can do at that, then the faster I run at the end of the day. And that interference doesn't bother me. Um, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this just to get an idea, so you have an idea. Like this is... When I start talking about applying this, right, this is a model by Gould um, talking about this ideal mindset. The idea is, right, when we get to this ideal mindset, right, it allows efficiency of operations, right, um, and that we come to all of this with some foundation, right, that's genetic, it's personality, it's motivational, it's philosophical, like we bring this kind of foundational experience, and then to get to our ideal, we, we have to train to it. And there is one side of this that is just the mental skills, right? And you may have heard of these things like self-talk and goal setting, right? And mental rehearsal, right? These are like the mental skills that facilitate peak performance that help us get to this ideal mindset. We also then have to deal with adversity. So the other side of this triangle, right, is just resilient skills. They're different skills, right? Used in different ways. Um, because sometimes to, to be a top performer, you don't always have to be resilient because you're not always going to fail, uh, right? Sometimes you're just going to have success. Um, so, but oftentimes we want to have both of those types of skills and think about them that conceptually they're different, right? Um, and that the environment and situation, I couldn't, I couldn't draw arrows all over this, but essentially it's impacting everything, right? Um, and so we have to then adjust, right? When we're constantly adjusting to get the efficiency you want, right? So that we can perform to our best. Um, Sean McCann is a sports psychologist with the um, USOC Olympic Committee. And he did this for in a coach's magazine. I just really love this way he talked about it, like this idea of preparation to execution in the Olympics. So he talks about kind of preparing for the Olympics. I think this gets at that brain efficiency, right? Like you're moving, right? Paragraphs to bullet points, right? I love student to graduate, right? Um, abstract to concrete, right? As we move towards execution, we are really talking about making the brain more efficient. Um, and again, I've kind of talked about my last slide here before I ask questions. Um, this may seem odd that I'm putting a traffic light up here. Um, but, you know, I think most performers, military, athletic, um, yeah, 
giving a talk um, to a group of people over Zoom or over Google Meet, right? And so any performance that we're talking about, um, we often think we're kind of in green light, which means um, I usually ask you this question, um, but it, um, green light's pretty obvious, right? We just go, like we're in it, we're going, right? I would suggest to you actually that most performers are not in green light, right? And um, we have to take a moment to figure out where we are. So uh, those of you who wouldn't mind, what do you do at a yellow light? Come on, give me some answers. What do you do at a yellow light? Not all at once. Speed up. Speed up. Okay, what else? Slow down and prepare to speak. Slow down. Absolutely, right? You check. Is there a red light camera? How many people are around me? Right? Uh, do I just actually maintain my speed? The important part of a yellow light? Oh, there you go. It depends on how far I am out from the light. Exactly, right? Like, all the yellow light is an assessment. It's an awareness. Right? Am I efficient in this moment? Am I where I need to be? Right? And I think that performers have to consider this, right? If they want successful performance, they have to ask themselves, right? And that's not just a physical question. Are my muscles warmed up, right? Is, it, is my brain ready for performance? Am I ready to operate efficiently, right? Do I need to hit the gas? Do I need to energize? Do I need to decrease my energy, right? Or do I just maintain? All athletes often know when they've hit red light, red light, they stop, they get overwhelmed, right? I, I try to prevent athletes from, and, and most performers from getting to that red light moment. And so many of you probably seen that um, in your experience. Um, so my last one is just questions. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I know some of you had some interference today as you, as you were listening to me, um, and I certainly uh, appreciated uh, the attention. Well, Dr. Muller, thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation here on uh, the brain and, and peak performance. Uh, for the folks in the audience who'd like to pose a question or a comment here, please, I'd ask you to put it in the chat and, uh, and I'll recognize you and then you can come off uh, microphone. If, uh, Dr. Muller, if I could maybe pose the, the first question, you, you, you talk a lot about quieting and your, uh, your second to last slide, you talked about some of the mental skills for facilitating peak performance. Can you maybe build upon what are some of those techniques that, that you can use to help quiet the, uh, quiet the brain to aim for that uh, sweet spot of, of peak performance? Absolutely. Um, so I think there are a number of, of ways to quiet the mind. Um, I will say, you know, everybody has, um, their own way of doing it and learning how to do that is so important. I think the kind of first, um, the, the first way that we intervene is by recognizing, becoming aware of what um, those um, kind of active thoughts are, um, trying to help somebody become aware of what they are, um, and then um, teaching somebody to kind of not let them have power. Um, and so that may be some kind of right, relaxation technique, mindfulness technique, right, kind of essentially bringing the mind from where it is, right, back to the present moment. Um, and that is trainable. I mean, it's like any muscle that we have in our body, right, the brain also has to train to that shift from recognizing my mind is kind of loud to bringing it back to the moment. Um, and so that may be just a refocusing on the breath, right? Um, it may be um, focusing on, um, you know, something they do in their hands, right? It may be refocusing on, you know, something that's going on around them to somehow bring them back to the, the present moment. Um, you know, there are a number of ways to um, kind of use, I'd say, what, what I call like a, a relaxation technique type of intervention. There's also, right, ways in which we can begin to activate, activate the thinking mind in a way that's controllable. Right, so um, I often talk about right self-talk as a way to actually keep. I mean, I'm keeping that mind active, but I'm keeping it active in a way that's controllable. So um, having an ideal mindset. I actually I show this video a lot when working um, with any group. Any group. Um, it's of Aaron Donald. He's a, a football player. He got mic'd up for the Super Bowl. It's a great little clip. Um, in which he's walking around, he's about to play, and he's mic'd up, so you hear everything he's saying. And he's literally walking around, saying to himself, let's be great, controlled aggression, let's be great, controlled aggression. He does not stop talking. And what I know is if he is activating his kind of thinking brain with that information, what he's not doing is 
oh my gosh, I'm about to play in the Super Bowl. Like, what if I mess up? Like, what if I don't tackle the guy? What if I, you know, he's not doing that because he's saying controlled aggression, controlled aggression. And we know the brain cannot have two simultaneous thoughts, right? It's going to switch potentially, but we know we, we don't multitask, we switch task. So at the very least, at least some of that time, it's going to be activated, right, by something that's controllable um, and, and directed that then maybe is going to get somebody to their ideal mindset. So sometimes intervention is, literally quieting, right? We are getting them to focus in the present moment. Sometimes quieting is actually by getting active, but in a deliberate and, um, you know, specific way. Fascinating. Uh, Major Sanchez. Good afternoon, ma'am. I just was, I was wondering, what are the greatest performance inhibitors that you see amongst uh, our midshipmen? Um, that's a good question. Um, actually, one of the greatest, um, which is I think true for almost every midshipman, is sleep deprivation. Um, okay, so, right, and that, I mean, literally you can't overcome it. Like there's no way to overcome it. It just is, right? So your reaction time is gonna go down and you're gonna have no idea it's gone down. In fact, you're gonna deny it. You're gonna say, no, my reaction time is fine. You're not gonna have any personal awareness of it. Um, and you're gonna say, I'm good to go. And your reaction time numbers are gonna like stay. And that's what all the data suggests to us. Um, so that's one piece. Um, the, the second piece is, um, I, so the, the performance pressures, um, what they make out of the outcome and how important and valuable it is to them at the times as even like as humans and how they evaluate themselves. Um, so I do think the performance outcome, you know, um, typically is the, is the interference. Um, you know, they, they want to, whatever it is they want to achieve, right? Whether it's a grade on the PRT right, whether it's just not failing the PRT, whether it's, you know, um, you know, making the special operating com operators community, right, like, so, like, that idea of, like, service selection, right, and kind of in that training environment and how that can inhibit, but I really do think it's the outcome, right, there are very few performers who can literally focus on the outcome and somehow by, like, focusing on more of that meaning perform better. Like it, just, it just doesn't happen, right? We focus on something we have control over to achieve that outcome. But that outcome, I think, is really distracting to people, um, incredibly distracting. Yes, I have, I have maybe a, uh, an observation to share with you. Immediately prior to this, I was chatting with, uh, with another pilot here in the Stockdale Center. We, we both were pilots in the, uh, you know, earlier in our careers. And we were commenting on, on our period of peak performance was probably as a senior lieutenant, as a senior 03, where we've been flying our planes for a long time and we really have very minimal other distractions in, in management. And we were uh, uh, remembering both of us together how when you get in the touch and go pattern, you know, where you just stay in a loop, the time seems to freeze, that all the, the handles seem to move by themselves. And it really matched perfectly with your, with your first slide that you showed, where, you know, as a, as, a, as a lieutenant, we seem to have it figured out and the plane just magically did what we were thinking without our having to think about it. I, I, I'm presuming here that you would say that we were in that sweet spot of high performance without having to think where, System uh, System One was was running things. Do you do you, uh, do you have any thoughts or, or comments on that as applied to an aviation uh, situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, right? Um, those moments, right, which are I think for performers they almost crave those moments. Um, yeah, they there were probably not a lot of other pressures on you in that moment. Right. In terms of like what you had to accomplish, there was probably a, a feeling of like challenge, but not being over challenged. Right. Of, of being able to be in that moment. And there is this automaticity. I mean, it just becomes automatic the way in which right, we operate in that moment. And that is what we're training towards. I mean, that's what we do. All the physical training we do. The challenge of it is when you somehow don't integrate that mental training, then we really at times don't prepare for the moment there's now other things going on. So what I'd, I'd be so curious about, right, um, is in those touch and goes, you know, did they ever um, pretend as if there were other demands going on, 
right? So that, right, you're now having this extra performance pressure and actually have to now switch, shift, right? This brain that you have from this, maybe would, what would create more noise, like some emergency, right? To a quieter mind. Um, and that you have to train to that. Um, and that sometimes doesn't come from, um, like Doug Baldwin talks about this. He's a receiver for, he was a wide receiver with the uh, Seattle Seahawks. And he started dropping the football. He's a wide receiver, played millions of dollars to catch a football. And he stopped being able to catch it, right? And so what would most, most trainers or coaches kind of say to do? Well, go out and practice catching. Well, his problem was that he didn't, he didn't, he knew how to catch a football. That wasn't the issue. It was catching a football after he dropped it a couple times, right? When a very large person was chasing him down, when the catch depended on moving the chains, right? And the team depended on him. That's when he was dropping it. And if you're not training to that, those moments when it's, it's not as easy, right? Then you will maybe not have as quiet of an experience as an automatic experience when all those other things happen. Did that answer that question? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Jesse, do you uh, care to venture where brain science is going to take this particular field of study looking forward in the next uh, decade? Oh, no, I don't know. It's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, I think that we're, I mean, the research that was being, um, you know, done here was really about um, understanding the pilot. Um, you know, essentially the plane would be a, a human robot, right? So the plane would take over more responsibilities, right? More tasks when the pilot was overloaded. And when the pilot then was not as overloaded, right? The, essentially the plane would give back the pilot, right? Its resources. Um, think about that, right? In like our sleep world and aviation and being downed. I mean, th there's all kinds of interesting dynamics, right? That this then creates. But if we can measure in real time, right? somebody's cognitive workload, it really opens up a lot of possibilities, right? We, we talk about this even with the drone flyers, right? Like, do they have the necessary activation? Actually, do they have like the necessary stress to be flying, right, from whatever their locations are, right, uh, you know, overseas and doing these, you know, mission critical operations when they're like in this safe, comfy chair right back in the U.S., right? Because we absolutely know that with arousal and anxiety, we do see performance increase. Um, right. So I think it's I think it's really interesting. Um, but I do think we're probably going to a more measurable. We will get more specific in our ability to measure. Mr. Bob Schultz, please. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you, Jessica. Um, one of the one of the guys that I work with, uh, a guy named Rich Davini, has written a book called um, The Attributes. And his argument is, if you haven't heard of it, that uh, that in the SEALs and in other organizations, they're not interested so much in peak performance, which is a very dis high performance in a very discrete time, but uh, what he calls optimal performance, which is per which is more based on perseverance, and argues that there's a whole different set of uh, mental skills associated with being able to persevere over time, rather than to be able to uh, to bring it all together when you're landing that airplane on the aircraft carrier or when you're doing that sprint in the finals of the Olympics. So uh, any of your thoughts on that? Are you familiar with his concepts at all? So I'm not familiar with his concepts. I'm, I would be, yeah, I will absolutely look it up. Um, but I think it's an interesting idea. I'm, I'm not so sure I see them as different concepts, but as potentially kind of, um, uh, arriving at the kind of continuum of performance at some different level, right? So certainly when I'm talking to um, somebody about making it through the SEAL screener versus a thrower, right, who's going to, you know, it's what, how long does a throw take, right? I mean, it's seconds, right? And it's all technique. It's this very short period of time, right? Um, there are different ways I approach, right, the mental um, aspect of that, the mindset they will need for success within those environments. Um, I do think it's really important to think about what are though, I think it's interesting, the attributes, I can use that word, what are the attributes, what are the characteristics of that environment, right, that you need to match to have success? And I, I honestly, I think that there's probably a lot of, um, there's a whole continuum of that, right? I could even name different sports, right? I mean, a marathon, again, versus a, you know, a thrower. 
right? It, it just, the demands are so different. You have to think about the task demands and then what's the mindset that gets us there. And I can certainly see perseverance, right, for um, in the field community, right, or special operating community would be uh, um, critically important. Um, yeah. Yeah, both of, both of them are. And he uses the example of, of laying in the surf zone at night when it's freezing cold. He's not interested in peak performance. He's just trying to trying to get through it. And uh, and and he talks about that as well. And it's just it was an interesting dichotomy. I just thought I'd throw that your way. And you're right. I mean, it's similar to the difference between the sprinter and the marathon runner. Um, uh, yeah. I, I do think it's an interesting idea, though, right? Like, so I, so I, I talk about that, um, you know, again, whether it's a kind of getting through it, is it just getting through it, or is there a performance component to it, right? Um, and, you know, I, maybe, again, it's my lens that I look through that I do begin to think of kind of everything has a performance component, right? Like, even if it is just kind of getting through it, you're trying to get it through, getting through it better than the guy next to you. Like, there's a competition that exists within all of us um, that we're always kind of trying to, you know, potentially, right, it's a survival mechanism, right, like that we're competing with our fellow person. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd wonder how he potentially would kind of see that in our interplay, right? Because I do think there's some performance. I want to, I not only want to get through this, I want to get through it a little better than the guy next to me. Um, or maybe there's some times where that's not the case, that it's really a team environment um, where you're where you're really working together. But I think people often want to do it a little better than the person next to them. Um, so that's just interesting, yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Jessica Moeller from the Naval Academy's uh, Midship and Development Center, we, we appreciate your time and, uh, and this fascinating presentation on the brain and peak performance. Uh, we, uh, we, we thank everyone for participating today. And so on behalf of the officers and staff of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, we hope that uh, you'll join us for another uh, presentation in this series uh, on brain, uh, the human brain and effective leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you.